Okay, welcome back to our Zoe's lecture series, what social science research tells us or has told us about Ukraine. We are running this uh, weekly lecture series in cooperation with the Department of Social Sciences at Humboldt University in Berlin. And tonight's speaker is Dr. Ola Unuk. She is an associate professor at the University of Manchester in the UK. And her talk will be on support for democracy and civic duty among Ukrainians the basis for civic identity and civilian resistance. And she'll be presenting work in progress, but on very exciting, um, there will be very exciting new fresh data in her talk. And I'm very happy that she agreed to participate in this lecture series. I've uh, personally known Ola for a very long time and we cooperate on a number of Ukraine related projects. And of course, it's always a pleasure to, to listen to your thoughts, to your analysis. And among all his wide, wider research interests are the comparative study of protest, elections, migration, and identity in Eastern Europe and Latin America. And Ukraine, I think it is fair to say, has featured very prominently in her research. Her book, Mapping Mass Mobilization, Understanding Revolutionary Moments in Ukraine and Argentina, so comparing Ukraine in 2004 and Argentina in 2001, which was published by Paul Grave in 2014. She presents a very detailed analysis of dynamics of how mass mobilization builds. And I think what is very special about this book and about her research in, in general is that it has a real intra-regional comparison built into it. And that is still very rare in this field. Ola is also the, um, the lead or the PI or co-I of, of many externally funded projects. I only mention um, a couple. Um, she is the overall lead and um, ESRC PI of Mobilize. This is a project looking at the determinants of mobilization at home and abroad, analyzing the micro foundations of out migration and mass protest. It is funded through the open research area. And in addition to the ESRC and Ola, we're happy to be involved as choice on the German side as well. Ola is also um, the PI of the British Academy funded project Identity and Borders in Flux in the case of Ukraine. So this already, I think, is, is one part of what, the, what she presents today is also uh, related to this project. And she's also, I'd like to mention, uh, part of the research team that presented in this series last week when we heard about the data for Ukraine uh, project. And um, I also want to add that Ola is a very active commentator in the media, not only um, in war times, but also um, in, in more normal times on Ukraine and Eastern Europe. And she's consulted um, many uh, governments, among them the Ukrainian and the UK government. So without further ado, Ola, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for participating in this series. Thank you very much, Gwen, for the really lovely introduction. And uh, of course, Gwen is also one of the PIs of the Mobilize Project, I should say here, and one of the people who about now, maybe 12 years ago, came up with the, the, the kernel of the idea that we have. And I will give you a glimpse of one finding from that project today as well. So it's, of course, very difficult to continue to conduct research on Ukraine in this context, not least when someone is Ukrainian and their family are in Ukraine, their friends are in Ukraine, and so many of their colleagues that they are still working with on a day-to-day -day basis are in direct harm's way. So Yes, the title is as it was supposed to be, but I added a little bit in there. So support for democracy and civic duty in times of crisis, or why Ukrainian Democrats and their tractors make this war unwinnable for Russia. And whether or not Putin understood this, whether or not advisors in the Kremlin understood this in February, 2022, I'm fairly sure that they are getting a keen understanding of exactly what I'm going to present to you now. So uh, since for the past uh, now 16 years, um, since my graduate work, and then uh, thereafter 12 years of postgraduate, uh, po uh, post PhD research, I've been really obsessed with these three theoretical uh, ideas. 
um, expectations around what drives civic identity, uh, expectations around uh, how civic identity is connected to political engagement and policy preferences or political dispositions citizens might have, and also how these two uh, theoretical elements are connected then to a sense of civic duty. And I, you know, I've been toying with a combination of these theoretical expectations in all of my research uh, for quite some time. And of course, in the in the mobilized project, uh, this is exactly the, the 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 questions that we are investigating. But before I continue on to the questions or the substantive matter that I want to present to you, and I hope you will agree with me that it is indeed absolutely striking and fascinating, I just wanted to thank our colleagues in Kiev, who not only, with, without whom not only would none of this research have, uh, would be a possible over the past eight years that we've been working very closely together, but also the research that is ongoing and the reason why I can present to you today would not be possible. Uh, and I just wanted to show this message from Natalia Hartenko, who is our partner and in charge of the survey research at KIS. Uh, they are in fact continuing research. They are continuing to conduct omnibuses. They are putting back together their team and they are ready to go. So if you are a scholar that still has some funding available, or if you are perhaps a policymaker, consider reaching out to KIS and I'm sure you will not be disappointed by their professionalism. So let's go to the questions. In 2019, when we started out the Mobilize project, we were really preoccupied with this idea in times of crisis, do people exit or do they voice? Do they take this fight option and try to fight for their rights and fight for a better future? Or do they flee? Uh, so when discontented, why do some people mobilize by protesting in the streets? Why others mobilize by leaving the country? And we found some very interesting things in the first wave of our data, which we also collected in Ukraine we found very clearly that there is a pattern whereby those who are Democrats and believe that the democracy, the democratic system is best for their country are about just under 10% more likely to protest than not to protest. And in fact, those who do not believe that democracy is a good system or might we might consider them as not being Democrats are about 4% less likely to engage in, in, uh, in uh, protest. And so what we do know is that democracy is connected to engagement uh, and being a Democrat is connected to engagement whilst the absence of being a Democrat was connected to migration. We also found very interestingly that those who believe that there is a use to vote, that the vote is important, that there is something uh, that the vote does that is influential, uh, were also more likely to be protest participants, unsurprisingly. And those who thought there was no use to voting, uh, they were more likely to decide to exit or flee the country. Similarly, those who tended to vote were also far more likely to want to protest should the, should the situation ne necessitate. And those who did not vote uh, were far more likely to, uh, uh, to want to leave the country. Uh, and finally, um, we found there was a very clear, no matter which way we sliced it, whether we looked at um, satisfaction with government, whether we looked at civic duty, whether we looked at vote or protest engagement in the past, whether we looked at um, indicators of trust, we found that repeatedly that political uh, factors, those associated with pro-democracy positions, were more connected to engagement or protest or fight or voice and economic factors, dissatisfaction specifically with the economy in one's country, were far more likely to drive the exit or flight options. So 
this is us in 2019. We think we have some interesting findings. And of course, then the pandemic happens. And we have to, at this moment, recalibrate everything we know and everything we think, not only about the exit and voice trade-off and dynamic, but also what, what, what would we now expect to happen in Ukraine? And what happens, of course, in Ukraine, as opposed to the other countries we study, which are Poland, Argentina, and Morocco, in Ukraine, the pandemic compounds already existing severe crises. So we have an ongoing economic crisis and near economic collapse. We have, uh, of course, the ongoing war with Russia, specifically in the Donbas. And we have now this global health threat that is clearly uh, presenting a huge issue for, for ordinary Ukrainians. So in 2020, really, the stage was set for a load of bad things to happen in Ukraine. People would not only see their livelihoods and their economic well-being decline, they would, they would also be more likely to see their health prospects decline and perhaps have family members who would die. And they would continue to face the war threat personally or uh, in the country as a whole. So the stage was set also because there was deeply polarizing and politically precarious context in Ukraine at the time. Following Zelensky's election, even though he won a landslide victory, his opponents continuously used very divisive and polarizing language. That coupled with an ongoing tripartite uh, crisis, we might expect citizens to turn away from democracy in these instances. We might expect citizens to turn away from democratic institutions and also from their civic duty. And perhaps, this decline in civic duty and turning away from democracy would also result in their willingness to abandon the state and flee. And this is exactly what happened elsewhere, actually. Democracies across the globe saw support for democracy decline, uh, saw trust in government crash, uh, saw trust institutions also fa fall quite sharply. And in some cases, this is where we can be talking about uh, the United Kingdom, we can be talking about the United States, but also across the region um, in Eastern Europe, certainly in places like Poland, we saw a, a large uh, portion of these factors decline uh, in the view of ordinary citizens. In fact, um, Henry Hale, Vladimir Kulik, and Gwen and myself, we wrote about this potential trade-off that in Ukraine specifically, citizens were, there were, some citizens were more concerned about the war, some were more concerned about the economy, and others still were more concerned about COVID. And it was very difficult for any government in 2020 in Ukraine to be able to uh, deal with all the three crises simultaneously. And anyone that was a betting person at the time, again, would have expected that dissatisfaction would grow, that perhaps support for democracy would decline, and perhaps as would civic duty. We all know what happens, uh, sadly, in 2022. Russia escalates the invasion of Ukraine in an all-out whole country assault. Uh, Western expectations are low, uh, precisely because Ukraine has just experienced uh, almost two years of uh, pandemic, economic crisis, and war simultaneously. Uh, in fact, we know that our Western um, uh, policymakers expected that Russia would be able to take Kyiv in 72 hours. Um, and they expected that uh, Russia could take uh, Kyiv in 72 hours, not simply because of Russia's military capacity and capabilities, but the expectation was also that you ordinary Ukrainian citizens who had just lived through two years of uh, this tripartite, trifecta crisis, would not be actually fighting and defending in some parts of the country specifically for, uh, on behalf of the Ukrainian state. And so uh, our Western uh, partners um, offered to evacuate President Zelensky. But of course, we now know famously Zelensky said, I need ammunition and not a ride. But Zelensky is not special in this. He is not uh, a particular 
amazing leader. He is just simply, I'm going to argue here, a very ordinary Ukrainian, because his sentiment, I need ammunition, not a ride, was exactly the sentiment of ordinary citizens doing those incredibly inspirational things that we all saw whether it was Ukrainians taking their tractors to task uh, uh, and, and towing tanks off uh, streets through fields and so on, whether it was individuals uh, trying to stop tanks with their bare hands. And now that we are three months into the war, it is really difficult because we forget that in that first week, people were trying to stop tanks with their bare hands in ordinary villages across the country. And of course, in places like Kherson, uh, where some of the worst human rights abuses are happening today, in fact, uh, even after occupation, uh, ordinary residents of Kherson decided to mobilize against the occupational forces. Now, the size of the protests that occurred in Kherson over March and April, those were very large protests for that city. And considering the, uh, the stress and repression and risk associated uh, with engaging in these sorts of activities during occupation, this was truly amazing. So one might look at this and think, well, this is simply a rally around the flag effect, right? There's a war, the leader is putting on a brave face, ordinary people are doing anything and everything because they are desperate to protect their homes. Uh, they are rallied uh, to support the Ukrainian state and nation, and that this is all very new and as a result of the aggression from Russia and occupation by Russia, and not something that was perhaps there amongst Ukrainians before. There is definitely some rally around the flag effect. Um, I am certain, and hopefully in about a week or two weeks time, we can tell you a little bit more because we will have even newer data to, to see what is going on in the ground. And that's in line with political science research. But what is really cool about uh, our mobilized project data um, is that we have been studying civic identity, uh, political engagement, uh, democratic dispositions and civic duty across these last three years. And we have been doing this employing a methodology that uh, panel survey data methodology, whereby we try to collect responses from the same people over time. And we have, especially between the second wave conducted in 2021 and the uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened, but you all disappeared for a second. I hope this is still going okay and you're, everything is recording properly. Um, everything is fine on our end. Okay, it just everything disappeared on my screen. Sorry about that. So, uh, but the cool thing about the data we have from the wave two, which was collected in January, 2021, and wave three, which was collected between December, 2021 and February, 2022, is that we were able to re-interview 792 of the same individuals. And we are able to account for a variety of different variables and factors that might change between different samples should we have just asked two separate groups of individuals these questions at these points in time. So be, this, is, this is very, it's, it's very rare to have this kind of data. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you in a second, and I hope you agree that what we were able to find using this data is quite neat. There are major shifts in political attitudes and policy preferences in Ukraine between 2019, when Zelensky becomes president, and February 2022, about eight days before the all-out invasion of Ukraine by Russia. First, things were bad, right? Uh, and they continued to be quite bad in some cases. So intention to migrate uh, has been very high throughout this period. It started out around 37% in 2019, and we can say that it pretty much stayed the same over time. So if you think that almost 40% of the population wants to leave the country, that is not a very good indicator for the country's stability, uh, economic context, and certainly does suggest that there are things that are problematic and that citizens are discontented in some way. 
Furthermore, the pandemic really did uh, hit Ukraine hard and ordinary citizens uh, experienced the pandemic in, in quite a awful and tragic way. In fact, uh, the number of individuals that know someone personally who has died from COVID by February 2022 was 45%. That's an astounding figure. 45% of a country's population personally know someone who has passed away from COVID-19. But then all sorts of weird things started also happening. Uh, something that I've been preoccupied, tracking uh, protest readiness. It rose and it rose to levels uh, that we had not seen in the last eight years uh, to Euromaidan levels, which is around 55%. Uh, but by February 2022, readiness to protest, to engage, to take to the streets, to defend one's rights was at 60% of the population. Furthermore, a lot of people have talked about the Zelensky's approval rating declining over this period. The story is a little bit more complicated, actually. Our data from 2019 show that his approval rating right at the time of his election was about 23%. He received a post-election bump, which depending on how you ask this question goes to about 55% of the population directly approving uh, of him as president. Uh, and then it declined by February 2022 to about 33% uh, approving of him as president. Uh, but um, his the approval rating for him uh, in his handling of COVID actually went up in that last year of the pandemic to 43% from 38 in 2021. So it's a mixed picture. Uh, it certainly does not say that people were approving of Zelensky consistently over time at a very high rate, but it's not quite exactly what people were saying, at least colloquially. And if we compare this to past presidents, in fact, Zelensky's approval rating was much higher than all three of his predecessors at the same point in the presidency. So three years into the presidency, uh, Poroshenko's, um, uh, this is rating group data here at the, on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, the, the solid line, his uh, uh, approval rating fell to about 17%. Three years in, after three, after two years of pandemic, compounding three crises and so on, Zelensky's approval rating is at 33 so it's quite a great deal higher than his immediate predecessor, uh, which would be most comparable because of the war context, um, had. And if you look at that red line, you can very clearly see that Zelensky's approval rating still was, by February 2022, although not very high, higher than what he actually started off with. Furthermore, and I found this to be quite shocking, to be perfectly frank, considering that the economy and the pandemic did not go very well at all, and there was no peace solution in the Donbass. Dissatisfaction with the government uh, declined, although still very high in February 2022 at 56%, it declined from 68% in 2019. Furthermore, and I think those who study politics for uh, quite extensively or compare specifically this indicator across um, Europe will find this beyond shocking. Uh, trust in institutions is notoriously low in places like Ukraine. And it is still quite low in February 2022 at 18%, for instance, trust in national government, 13% uh, as trust in political parties. But this trust has increased since 2019 with 8 and 5% respectively. So when it comes to trust in national government, there was a 10 percentage point rise between April 2019 and February 2022. And of course, we know NATO, support for NATO also continued to rise over this period. Uh, and in fact, before we had the freshest data from 2022, we wrote about this and we had this hypothesis that there might be a Zelensky effect, that it, it is possible that Zelensky's presidency was able to bring certain people on uh, to uh, a pro-NATO position. And this is exactly what we found when we conducted some regression analyses uh, that 
those who vo voted for Sluha Narodu, the president's uh, party, were just about 19% more likely to have moved over this period to a pro-NATO position. Similarly, we found that those who resided in the east and in the south specifically of the country were also more likely to move to a pro-NATO position. And this is where we started to toy with the idea that there might be some kind of Zelensky effect happening in Ukraine. Now here's the really, really big surprising part. And every time I look at this data, I do not, it's not, I, I'm, it's not a joke, it's not an overstatement, I am not exaggerating, I have shivers just right now, because between 2019 and 2022, support for democracy at a time of ongoing war, extreme crisis, and an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic that resulted in 45% of the population knowing someone that has passed away from said pandemic, support from democ for democracy rose from 41% in 2019 to 57% of the population in February, 2022. I have scoured all of the, the democratization reports, uh, the comparative studies on democratization and support for democracy. I cannot identify any other locality where there is such a large jump in support for democracy over a three year period. Not only did support for democracy rise in this period, but so did a question that we were only able to add in 2021 to our research, civic duty did as well. In fact, uh, uh, civic duty seemed to be very high when it comes to civic duty to vote in Ukraine. In 2021, 81% of the population already said that they have a civic duty to engage in elections, that this is absolutely something that is integral to their role as citizens. Uh, but in one year, in one year, this went up by six percentage points to 87. So by February 2022, 87% of the population thinks it's their civic duty to engage in elections. Similarly, when we ask people, do they have a civic duty to engage in political and or civil society activities beyond elections? 50% told us that they have a civic duty to do so in 2021. 20, uh, in one year, that jump is by nine percentage points to 59% of the population, thinking it is their civic duty to engage in extra institutional political participation. So this is the context we are seeing here in February, 2022. And Although a much smaller rise, uh, still we see a spike at a statistically significant level, uh, sorry, an increase at a statistically significant level of people who view protest as being part of their civic duty repertoire. So this is incredible. Uh, I, we were, something weird was happening in Ukraine. Uh, amongst ordinary Ukrainians, and I think many, many political scientists and sociologists missed it. There were moves towards democracy amongst ordinary citizens, specifically those in the East and South, specifically amongst those who live in areas that are predominantly Russophone, to democracy, to your Atlantic positions, increasing in their views uh, and their sense of civic duty, trusting government more, being dissatisfied by the government more. In fact, we also ask questions about views on policy. More people supported government policies. More people thought that the government is doing a good enough job in the Donbass. How can we explain this phenomenon? How can we explain such a huge jump in a one, two, three year period? Well, I'm going to propose to you some of this logic that, and thinking that I'm trying to unpack for myself. So this is still something that we are working through. And I think that this is an iterative and compounding effect of multiple things happening, regardless of the context, regardless of the multitude of crises ongoing. So I think political science research is right. There should be some partisan effects. Uh, specifically, if you voted for a party 
such as Sluha Narodu, and that party moves or champions certain policies, such as your Atlantic integration, then you would move to on those policies. Similarly, we would expect that for support for democracy. If the candidate or party you vote for, then later after the election really pushes a discourse that is about democracy, about civic duty, about civic engagement, about the import of citizens in the society, then you too would move to that position. Also, we might expect an our son, our daughter effect um, of the candidates who mirror the electorate. So specifically, one might argue that a candidate such as Zelensky, that was really unapologetic for his Rus Russophone, um, uh, the fact that he was a Russian speaker. Um, in fact, in the campaign, he said, you have to forgive me. I don't use Russian all the time, uh, Ukrainian all the time. Uh, and that he was from the Southeast, that he does come from fairly ordinary Ukrainian um, background uh, prior to becoming obviously uh, a well-known actor, um, perhaps that has some effect, right? People from those places, people that are Russophones, people that see themselves as embodied in this candidate or mirrored somehow in this candidate, that they would also then turn to positions that the candidate would propose, be they your Atlanticist positions or support for democracy. But I think there's another element here, and that is uh, the fact that there were actually democratic successes happening in Ukraine, and that they were clear policy successes happening in Ukraine. And that it is because of the policy successes themselves and the pushing for policies that people did support that uh, individuals also then came to support democracy. And lastly, one's own sense of civic duty, that civic duty being discursively reported in, uh, and repeated uh, in the discourse of, of, of parties, of candidates, that too would bring individuals to support democracy more. So in order to really figure out what's happening in Ukraine, you need to do two things. You need to look at who are those Democrats at each year in time. So who are those who support democracy in 2019? Who are those who support democracy in 2021? And who are those who support democracy in 2022? You also need to then check for those people uh, who are those individuals with a strong sense of civic duty, you need to check who are they in 2021 and who are they in 2022? And you need to kind of figure out that analysis a little bit more just to understand what is the starting place? Who are the Democrats in 2019? And who might we expect to be the Democrats by 2022? Then, because if you do have a, a specifically a panel data, you can create um, a binary variable or another type of variable where you actually look at those people who moved to a pro-democratic position. So those who told us in 2021 that they do not support democracy as, a, as the best system for Ukraine to those, uh, to those who moved to saying in 2022 that they in fact do support democracy. So why would somebody over a year's time change their position on democracy being the best system in Ukraine? Why would an individual change their position on believing that it is their civic duty to engage in elections or to engage in civil society uh, activities in one year's time? And here's some quick uh, survey results from that. So just very quickly, it's who are the Democrats? Well, nothing surprising about who are the Democrats if we just take snapshots at different points in time. They are people who actually tended to vote for Petro Poroshenko, unsurprisingly, because Petro's, Petro Poroshenko's electorate, that 25%, are very much uh, based in a particular part of Western Ukraine, where we do know that there have been higher levels of Democrats over time um, and people that have pro-liberal uh, and pro-Euro-Atlanticist dispositions and, and policy positions. They are also people, Democrats are also people who support Ukraine joining the EU. Again, not surprising because of the value alignment that might happen there. And Democrats are also people who tend to actually have a better family financial situation. They tend to be more middle class. Again, this is not surprising whatsoever, exactly what we would expect. Now, I'd like you to take a look at that dashed uh, blue arrow. Uh, and that's the really interesting part here for our data. 
is that the Democrats have a very high sense of civic duty. Not surprising, but in fact, the level of one's civic duty is the most important predictor of being a Democrat. These things go hand in hand. But who are the people who move to democracy? Well, here's where it gets really interesting, I think. They were not Petro Poroshenko supporters. Uh, they were people who also came to support EU more. Uh, uh, sorry, it's to support Ukraine joining the EU more. Uh, but they were also far more likely to be Sluha Narodu um, voters. So if you voted for Sluha Narodu in 2019, a servant of the people, um, Zelensky's party, the president's party, you were just about 11% more likely to become a Democrat. So having voted for Sluha Narodu, maintaining support also, which is something else I tested in the interim, drives the likelihood that you become a Democrat by February, 2022. Another very interesting uh, thing is that if you resided in Dnipropetrovsk Oblast, the locality from which Zelensky is from, you were also about 13% more likely to become a Democrat. And in fact, only Lvivska Oblast, the far, far west uh, oblast of the country, where we do have a great deal of Poroshenko supporters, for instance, was the only other oblast where we saw a positive correlation to becoming a Democrat. So people who were from Zelensky's home oblast were more likely to become Democrats. It's fascinating. And it's clearly suggesting that there is some Sluha Narodu, Zelensky post-election effect happening. So how do we explain this? Well. Let's go back to the things I said. I really do think there is an iterative compounding process that we have seen, but we have not been paying attention to in Ukraine over the last three years. One, democracy has repeatedly shown ordinary citizens of Ukraine that it's working and that citizens' engagement in democracy leads to the ends that they want, whether it was with the Yevromaidan in 2014 and the two very successful, peaceful, elections across the country in 2019, be they the presidential elections that brought Petro Poroshenko into the presidency, or later in the fall, the, the parliamentary elections. These were not polarizing elections. These were not elections that were fraudulent. These were fairly democratic, reasonably free and fair, and produced results that the general population could be in agreement with. When things started to not go so well, perhaps towards the end of the Poroshenko presidency, there might have been a fear that the 2019 elections would not produce the same result, that there might be some fraud, that the result will not be uh, held up by the political elite, or that there might be some intense polarization of the country as we have seen in the past. In fact, that's not what happened. We saw a rallying of voters. We saw a fairly peaceful election um, that was free and fair that resulted in, well, what the broad majority of the country wanted. And then this is followed up by an equally free and fair and fairly liberal democratic uh, election yet again in, for the parliament in 2019. Moreover, after such a landslide win by Zelensky and full control of parliament by his party, quite frankly, with the ability to pass almost any bill, Zelensky simply implements the successful policies of his predecessor, as well as other policies that he campaigned on. So what we see in this period is that democracy works. Citizens get what they voted for and politicians implement what they said they would. Zelensky's first three years of the presidency have been successful, and I think not enough people talk about this. He continued the most important policies of his predecessor and those that were highly popular amongst the opposition. 
negotiated a prisoner release that was seen to be uh, impossible, uh, according to Poroshenko insiders, uh, managed to pass um, or deputy immunity and passed land reform, something that every single one of the predecessors, every single president to date tried to do, but could not get done in parliament. Whilst we saw elite divisions quite prominently, the ordinary citizens of Ukraine, I don't think actually fell into this uh, elite discourse of divisions and, and uh, polarization. So they were convinced democracy works. Secondly, discursively, Zelensky did not decide to retaliate constantly once he became president. He instead really decided to lean into his own Ukrainization, one might say. Um, and he repeatedly used a narrative of unity. Uh, so I've done some extensive discourse analysis of his speeches as president, and repeatedly he uses civic symbolism throughout his speeches. This is not something that just starts when the war begins. This is in fact something that we see from his inauguration speech, where he talks about Ukrainians' European values as Europe not being somewhere out there, but being in the hearts and minds of ordinary Ukrainians. To his pandemic era speeches, where he talked about, he linked protecting oneself with protecting one's country, one's nation, specifically the Ukrainian nation. So he ended almost every single one of his uh, pandemic speeches with something akin to, let's take care of ourselves, let's take care of others around us, let's protect Ukraine. Now, this is very different from what we saw in the United Kingdom. Uh, I believe it was stay home, uh, save lives, protect the NHS. There's clearly a discursive, maybe it's populist in nature, perhaps, but clear decision to link the safety of individuals and their loved ones to the safety of Ukraine. And then there's this mirroring effect, right? We know that he never shied away from switching between Ukrainian and Russian language, using Surzhik in his speeches at times when he felt it was appropriate, but also talking about his upbringing in the southeast of Ukraine, and different symbols that may or may not be uh, connecting to different types of electorate in Ukraine as well. So you might have been paying attention quite intensely to his speeches since February 24th, but I urge you to take a look at some of the videos of his speeches prior, but also some of the content of his show, Serving for the People, and the videos of his uh, troop skits from Kvartal. Sometimes the humor is not the sort of humor that I particularly enjoy. I'm, I would say not even sometimes, more frequently than not. But going back in time now, uh, listening to, watching, and reading where possible the transcript, this discourse of civic duty, of speaking Russian yet being a patriot, of being from the East, yet being a patriot, uh, of wanting to be in Europe, in the European Union, of wanting to be part of even alliances that protect Ukraine, is something that comes repeatedly in those skits and in that show. So I guess those ordinary Ukrainians who were watching the skits or watching television show saw that over time, then saw that in his campaign speeches, and then saw that actually play out in real time in the policies and the activities of his presidency. Uh, the image at the bottom of your screen right there is actually a skit, again, not in a, the jokes, uh, some of them are, well, no need to say what kind, um, but the whole skit is about actually Kozaks uh, writing a, a letter to, you know who, uh, Mr. Putin, and using very traditional Ukrainian symbolism throughout the whole skit, references to particular historical moments in, in Ukraine that are tied to civic statehood. Uh, they really um, get a very interesting civic and state-centered message across. Um, so 
I hope you agree with me that it is absolutely fascinating that support for democracy increased among U Ukrainians in this short period of time. I hope you will agree with me that it is fascinating that it is precisely those people in the southeast of the country who perhaps were not central to the imaginaries of what it means to be a Ukrainian citizen um, in other periods of other presidencies. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you agree with me that it is exactly what we are seeing play out in the steps and in the streets of Ukraine today. And I think it's because ordinary citizens and Zelensky, perhaps in his multitude of speeches, understood that there is no need to think meagerly um, that Ukrainians are capable of a great deal more uh, only if they are shown by their political elite that in fact the political elite will implement that which they voted for. So in a final remark, uh, in a recent um, video about a, about a month ago, uh, Zelensky uh, was doing his evening address and he was reprimanding certain politicians for encouraging uh, suggestions about what, what territory should be given up by Ukraine to find peace. In fact, he was making a claim as to potential acts of treason that some politicians were uh, either in the process of committing or thinking of doing so. And it was also the night where Lina Kostenko's, I believe, 92nd birthday um, uh, was uh, taking place. Lina Kostenko is a very famous poet in, in Ukraine. She is also one of the most famous dissidents uh, from the 1960s onwards. And her poetry is something that sits in the hearts of many Ukrainians. And in his speech, trying to convince these political elite not to, in effect, commit treason. He cited Lina Kostenko's poem. There is no need to think meagerly. Immortality is still here. Some tested like a grain will fall into the ground. An artist doesn't need awards. Destiny rewards him. And this is the most important line. When one has a nation, she is a person. And then he continues in his speech that Ukrainians don't think meagerly. We have a nation. So I think that's where I'll end. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ola, for such also wide ranging um, talk now and, and so much interesting and, and very recent um, data as well. And I think you, you make us think about a lot of different things. Um, there are some questions in the chat already, but maybe to stick, uh, first of all, maybe to the data you presented, I start with one question by Fabian. Could you speak more about the representativeness of your survey data? Maybe a little bit more about the data collection. I think you had it on a slide, but maybe it's worth talking a little bit more about this and also maybe how it was replenished. Um, yes, maybe we start with that. Right, so our survey data is um, each, each individual wave is nationally representative in nature. And we also, in the first two waves, we also oversampled in uh, large urban centers across the country. But all of our data is then later weighted to the population to, again, make sure that it is indeed representative in the analyses. So uh, what we did in wave one is we collected uh, 2,000 uh, survey uh, interviews um, with 2,000 individuals. It, you have to remember that the first wave was in 2019, and therefore uh, the pandemic hit. But right before we were about to collect the second wave and we had to decide what we were going to do, we had to move away from face-to-face -face surveying, and we had to move to telephone surveying, as everyone else did during the midst, uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Because of that, uh, our mode did change from wave one to wave two. We were able to um, re-interview just over, I believe, uh, 
600 individuals from the first wave. And then we replenished that second wave to be nationally representative uh, yet again to 1,600 individuals. And then uh, when we conducted the third wave, once again, we were able to re-interview 792 individuals from the second wave and just under 200 and 60, I believe, from the first wave, uh, but uh, the rest uh, were indeed, uh, the, the sample was um, uh, replenished in order for the, the final wave to be nationally representative in itself. Does that answer the question? It does. Thank you. I think that that's, it was on a slide, but it was quick, so I think it's a, it's a relevant question. Um, and Valodia asks about um, your uh, emphasis on policy successes, and you said that greater support for democracy was in part due to policy successes, and um, he wants to know, can, can one actually prove this? Is there more information on that? Are there real sort of positively correlated things? And he mentions, for example, how about land reform? Would you say that new democracy supporters also tend to support this reform? Maybe that is quite specific, but maybe you can add a bit more on, on policy success, um, which I think is a also thought about it as you were talking, uh, how does that fit with um, nevertheless Zelensky's popularity declining? You, know, you said it's not as, as bad as Poroshenko's decline in popularity, but nevertheless, how do you kind of match sort of maybe, I think it's more also still a hypothesis, is it policy success or, or what is it? There's more democracy support, but nevertheless his, and you link it to him as a Zelensky effect, but his popularity nevertheless has somewhat declined so so maybe you can answer answer both those things or, or share share your views on this it probably requires more more research as well right so there's two things we in 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 the, all the models that i presented we include um positions on NATO policy and EU policy and whether or not people see that as linked to Zelensky, we've shown in other papers so we know that people's views on um Z Zelensky's position on NATO and on Ukraine and on Euro integration is seen as positive uh, amongst most people and the actions that he took in the time related to that. Uh, the other policy that we ask concretely for is policy around uh, support uh, of individuals in the Donbass. And we asked that at, at different times of our panel. And that is again, um, correlated positively to uh, higher rates of support for uh, Zelensky. Um, I, I think, Volodya, I think it's a little, we didn't ask the question, all the questions. We should have asked more questions about land reform and decentralization. And Nedator Kanis, I think that was a huge miss for us that we don't have a question on um, the immunity of deputies. Uh, and that, I think, is something that many, many uh, ordinary citizens saw as a huge success. Um, and quite frankly, a major promise of Zelensky's campaign. We did not ask that question specifically. Um, why? I honestly couldn't tell you why right now, because when you compile these uh, 80 question long questionnaires, there's so many things that go into the deliberations, as you know yourself. I wish we had that more directly. Um, uh, some of the evidence that I uh, am scraping and gathering about the policy support uh, or on the perception of policy success is through other means. There's other data that would confirm that people saw some concrete policies very positively. Uh, there's other people's surveys that would suggest this, and I hope in the future I can publicly include that in a talk or paper. And also there is some qualitative evidence that that, uh, that might be the case as well. So I think it's not something I can show causally, uh, but I'm trying to explain what I think is happening um, in the quantitative data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and Larissa is asking, did you consider the impact of war or also the threat of even bigger war on the rise of, of um, or in, of, on the rise in support for democracy, um, sort of taking into account the significant jump in support between 21 and 22? And there is already an increased threat from Russia. Um, so does that um, threat uh, explain perhaps some of that rise in that period? Uh, so two things. We can test for that exactly and explain. I'll explain how we can do so. Uh, but more importantly, our rise, the first big jump, happens actually between 2019 and 2021. So 
what we are seeing very clearly, and again, I'm trying to get other sources uh, on data about supportive democracy from Keys, our partners, as well as from other colleagues that might have asked the same question prior to 2019. My hunch is that there is an increase over a few years, actually. But so far, the biggest jump was actually between 2019 and 2021. So that's one part to your uh, question. Second part to your question, we can test for this exactly because that third wave of our survey was conducted over a period between December 2nd, 2021 and February 16th, 2022. Uh, the context and the perception of the threat of war on December 2nd, 2021 is very different from the context and perception of potential war on February, 2022. And this is a natural experiment of sorts that is that our just the field work um, makes possible. And that's something that actually, hopefully uh, Gwen and David Doyle and I will be able to look at in more depth shortly and tell you if in fact the biggest jumps were something, something happening during that three month or two and a half month period. Thank you. Um, there's a question, actually two people asking interrelated questions. Um, Mikhail was asking, um, there seems to be a tendency in Zelensky's closest circle towards a version of authoritarianism. Do you see support for such a shift among several of the people uh, voters who previously shifted to the more democratic profile? I mean, maybe there's sort of quite a lot packed into that question, but maybe it, it um, reiterates that, that some of the, maybe even the style in which decisions were kind of made, implemented, and because of also having an absolute majority in parliament, um, if I flash out this question a bit, um, there was certainly kind of that type of discourse as well. I mean, now we're clearly talking about the period before the war. Um, so maybe you, you you could comment a bit on that. So maybe it's, it, it doesn't maybe quite fit together so well. And, and Victor had asked the first question that Mikhailo refers to, uh, would you agree that the real test for democracy under Zelensky will, will only come with the next presidential elections or the election campaign? Poroshenko passed the test, what about Zelensky? And he also called it the trend in administrative monopolization of power and information uh, by him. Uh, so Mihailo, very good to not see you at the moment, sadly, but hello, hello. Um, uh, Victor, a very great question as well. Um, uh, I think here we really, I mean, I'm on the record, so I won't say my own personal views on the matter and how, if I had the opportunity, how I would vote in these elections. Uh, I can just hint that it would be in the way that you might think based on my presentation how about that. Um, so I think we really need to pause by the sorts of things we say about Poroshenko and Zelensky. First of all, Poroshenko himself showed tendencies towards authoritarianism that we seem to not have unpacked yet as political scientists quite openly and honestly, perhaps because we are from certain networks or even from directly, uh, the groups that may have been uh, more likely to vote for Poroshenko himself. Quite frankly, I think there's a lot to unpack there about Poroshenko's late, last, maybe even just the last year of his presidency specifically, but also in the way he behaved. I'm not quite sure, Victor, that he really passed that democracy test so brilliantly well in 2019. I mean, he went on an onslaught of, you know, I'm not even going to touch the personal critiques that he laid against uh, Zelensky. But he, he, this Russian revanche thing that he and his campaign uh, really ramped up between the presidential and parliamentary elections was just wild to see, specifically the revanche marathon that took place on his own television channel and the channel of his political supporters in the lead up to the parliamentary elections, which some of my friends actually participated in. When you have a four and a half, nearly five hour long Russian revanche marathon to claim that the current president, uh, should he be successful, will sell the country to the Russians and so on and so forth. That wasn't, the, there's loads to unpack about authoritarian tendencies and problems of media um, freedoms and uh, political ownership of media and all these sorts of things as well. That being said, Victor, I do agree with you that the, the real test will be for the next elections and how Zelensky behaves in those elections. 
uh, if and when they are possible, uh, how he calls the elections, are any rules changed to disadvantage his opponents? Uh, I think those will be all very important things. And I think many of us will obviously be uh, looking at that in quite great detail. Um, uh, that's, I think, that that there, Victor, I, I agree with you. I, I don't know what will happen next. And I hope that Poroshenko will equally uh, play an important role. And other, I think, major... Um, political leaders will play a very important role in ensuring that that process is democratic um, and not resort to sensationalist or personalist, personalist attacks. Uh, that may be too much to hope for, uh, but uh, I think that, I, I do think that political leaders in Ukraine have learned from some of their mistakes and are, have, been sh have shown that they are able to cooperate. And quite frankly, Poroshenko, and others also deserve praise for the passing of the most important laws that, uh, that I spoke to or policies that I spoke to. Uh, I think what we have seen over the last three years is that when a government has the control it needs, when there's good leadership and they are able to push for certain policies, and when opposition actors are willing to support those very important policies because they see them as good, then you see good things happen, right? Uh, of course, we can pick up on several different policies where there were major disagreements or ideological differences or even personal differences that did not result in such a success. So I, I don't think the, 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 the success is Zelensky's alone. Thank you. Again, as we're already looking into the future, I was going to keep those questions until the end, but let's put them in here now. And um, it's a question, one is by Aseni. Uh, and one, another one by Mikhailo. Let's start with Mikhailo. She also asks about the political party system, which um, uh, there have often been parties that are really projects by leaders rather than ideologically or policy-based parties. According to Lipset and Rocket, Rocket revolutions and wars can bring about new uh, cleavages. What might this mean uh, for Ukraine going forward? And Arseni had asked more specifically um, what this also means for um, leftist parties or social democratic um, values, if you'd like to speculate on this. If not, yeah, that's fine I, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and, and Mihaila knows as well, I do not like to speculate on anything that I don't have clear evidence and data to back it up. I save those for private conversations. I would just like to say one thing about, we were speaking about this yesterday actually with Henry Hale. Uh, if you look at support for different parties over time in our data, it's quite stable. And that's really interesting. It's, there are some bumps here and there, you know, potential moves. And of course, around an election, there will be some shifting. But over this last three-year period, we see a lot of stability, which is suggesting that the party system in Ukraine is actually becoming a little bit more stable than we saw it in previous years. To give you an example, if you look at the first three years of Poroshenko's presidency, you do not actually see the same level of stability in support for the top five political parties as you do in the last three years. So that's interesting. The fact that they're personalist and they're leader projects, that uh, they're all leader projects for the most part, populist in nature um, and centered around one key figure, that continues to be an issue and a problem. Uh, I think a lot of these also liberal democratic leaders um, uh, and maybe left-leaning liberal democratic leaders um, allowed this to happen, right? Uh, so there are ways to set up parties without making them all about yourself. Uh, there is a level of ego to believe that the only way your party will possibly succeed if, is if you connect it to your image and your popularity. I think the person that learned that the case, that that, that lesson most bitterly was um, Vakarchuk. Uh, I think for many reasons, there was a, a problem in the way that the party was um, conceived of. I think the it's the connection to, quite frankly, criticizing Zelensky for using his television show and his showmanship and his skits and so on during campaigning 
And yet organizing major con concerts across the country, doing exactly the same thing, uh, criticizing maybe at times even Poroshenko, but certainly uh, Zelensky for the personalization of their parties, yet doing the same thing when it came to your own party. That's a, precisely why people did not vote, I think, there, because they did not see that there was another message, but then there was just a replication of much of that was happening elsewhere, and perhaps even some, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for, Gwen? Hypocrisy, right? You can't criticize uh, another political candidate for personalization and using their entertainment uh, techniques or technologies when you do the same thing. Um, so I, I don't want to suspect what happens. I very much hope that we move away from leader-driven personalist parties in Ukraine. Maybe some of the parties that exist can turn into non person, non-leader, non-ego parties. And um, maybe that is where they will go in the future. Thank you, Ola. Um, and Newton um, put an interesting um, comment and suggestion also into the um, into the chat um, right at the end. And it's obviously it's too early again to answer the question, but I think um, the comparison will be will be interesting. Um, so the question is sort of how long lasting the support for pro-democracy or civic engagement will be and kind of there's other literature and there's one one example posted in the in the chat here on kind of war exposure and what that does to to civic engagement but um i think we we unless you want to comment on this already how you i don't know if you know the particular piece quoted if you want to refer to that or we just take it as a as a suggestion for future research there's actually a few papers with um, Tim Colton and Henry Hale that we've been trying to work on in the last eight years about war exposure and uh, the vote. Um, and we were using data from our earlier project to try to figure out what's happening. Um, so our earlier work suggests that actually war exposure did not decrease uh, attitudes uh, maybe pro-voting, pro-electoral, Ad ad attitudes. Um, so there, we didn't have questions about civic duty there, but we did have questions, obviously, are you intending to vote? Do you think voting uh, actually makes a difference and the like? And we did not see war exposure in that first year and a half of war actually make that big of a difference. We saw far, far more economic um, deprivation as being connected to uh, decreasing levels of electoral support and engagement. Uh, and hopefully that paper will come out at some point after the numerous reviews it has to go through and places it has to be in. Um, but this is where I think I don't know what will happen in the future when it comes to Ukraine. This is a very different war context than, of course, the one we were talking about in 2015 or so. I watch the context as it unfolds and the types of um, state-centric and nationalist language that is being used by different political leaders um, and actors. And I very much hope that the political leadership continues to tread lightly when it comes to some of these things, uh, because I think the, it, it's very easy in a war context to, to change the discourse of what it means to be a citizen, to change the discourse of what it means to be a good citizen. And if anything, we have seen over the last three years that it became clear that good citizens of Ukraine exist uh, and engage and think very positively and not meagerly across all corners of Ukraine. And they might be speaking different languages and they might have different preferences on some policies, in fact, but their patriotism is unquestioned. Uh, and I hope that continues and that the political leadership in Ukraine continues with this civic centered discourse and not focuses on ethno linguistic or ethno national um, differences and distinctions amongst the Ukrainian electorate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ola. I think when I put that earlier question about um, how rising support for democracy goes with um, sort of nevertheless a declining 
popularity um, of Zelensky before the war. Uh, Xenia had posted some some data also mapping that into the chat and and um, said also something about dissatisfaction with land reform, but then also added the point that maybe most uh, most average voters are not that interested in some of these policies. I think there's a sort of bigger question behind that as well. Um, uh, so how we, how we capture um, sort of this engagement again or interest in politics or um, what we can draw from that. And maybe I can add and another question of mine to that, I mean, you, you highlighted that the effect is strongest um, in Nipopetrovsk, but then also in Lviv and, um, or Oblast. And, and if you could sort of say a little bit more about either your hunch or what you can already see in the data, why in those two? I mean, in, in one case, clearly it is Zelensky's region, the other one very clearly is not. Um, um, how do you see that play out? And is it maybe other factors behind that? So when I, I think when it comes to Lviv, if we're looking just at who moved to support democracy, right? That's the, who moved to support democracy. I, there's nothing that surprises me about the fact that those who reside in Lviv, a place where the broad majority of Ukrainian Democrats, one might say, reside in any given survey, right? That those who do, who, who did not support democracy but resided there previously over a period where things seemed to be working out. Perhaps exactly they were the types of Lviv-based residents that did not vote according to the majority of uh, their neighbors, um, it, that they would move to more democratic positions, right? There's a lot that would explain, there's actually a lot of research in political science that if you live in a locality that has high rates of support for democracy, you, and there's different theories as to how this happens and mechanisms through which this happens, but you are then more likely to take on those ideas as well. Um, that's that's how I would think about Lviv personally. There's more, there's, you know, there's more analyses that we can do there, uh, but I was surprised that I didn't see shifts in other places um, that were very clear. Um, but what this suggests is that there is, it's because it's a very large shift across the country that there are shifts in a lot of places happening. So, in a, so it's it, oftentimes when it comes to understanding and analyzing Ukraine, we look to, okay, so is it in a particular region? Okay, so is it amongst a particular linguistic group? By the way, all of these, all of these analyses do not show that any linguistic group was more or less likely to shift on this. But that's not the answer here. The answer is that on average, across different localities across Ukraine, people shifted to pro-democracy position. And that's why we have to look to other explanations um, and try to make sense of them. And I think people can put forward other hypotheses as to why this is the case. Um, uh, and I, I'm open to that, certainly open to that. Uh, um, but we then have to try to somehow prove it. And that's the most tricky bit in hindsight, how to prove it, right? When you didn't ask those questions or you don't have that focus group data or whatever it is that you need. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, I mean, personally, um, for whatever it's worth, I think the argument you also put forward about um, Zelensky's um, discourse and framing um, is really important no? and, and maybe even not so much or maybe works in both directions that he, as you put it, Ukrainianized after the elections, but also that even before the election, I mean, his message was a very inclusive one, no? also speaking to citizens in Crimea, citizens in the occupied territories in Donbass and um, and then that that remained the same, no, whatever else did or did not work in terms of policy. I think that was a continuous uh, message. And that's also the message now. So I think there's this sort of line that probably accounts for something for how much I don't know. But I think um, that is that is that that seems like something that's often overlooked that there's actually well, you can say how much of an election program was there. OK, but there was something that tapped into kind of societal moves and that stayed very consistent, no? whatever else happens once you are um, elected. But there was also um, early on in the chat, it was a, sort of a discussion, a somewhat heated discussion about um, political democratic values or probably what you called support for democracy, but also taking it a bit back in time and, and without going through that now, um, maybe the question that really was behind that is if you look at, have you looked, I'm sure you have, at other data um, before 
2019, maybe also going back to 2004 or even earlier on democracy support. So if we look at, even if it's not neat panel data then, but is this sort of something that's more cyclical or would you say this is sort of uh, more gradual and, and kind of can we see any patterns there? Because um, yes, over time, is this something that really builds over time or is there something else at work which might also give us a, a hunch what else to look for in this period? You mean the support for democracy? Yes. Um, uh, gosh, I think so many people have been studying democratization. <laughs> you, you, one of them. I mean, also. in Ukraine in particular, data on Ukraine on, yeah. on this. So um, I think it could go a bit even with, say, um, Mark's argument, Mark Weisinger, no? so that in, in, in the moment of the revolution, it's against something, but it might not be uh, if you look at a very, if you have very detailed data on. Um, people's um, preferences and so on, it doesn't always align with the one call for more democracy, maybe bizarrely enough. No? So is there is there something in, in if, if uh, um, we often don't have, I, I think that sort of very detailed breakdown of data that he used, but um, sort of I'm just wondering, is this sort of in this period or what, what's, your, what's your take on that? If so it's not no a bigger question. Yeah, so there's no indication that in previous periods of time, Ukrainians had higher rates of support for democracy, and then it declined, and now it has gone up to a new record level. Uh, there were maybe some moves that 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 we can identify, but if you smooth out uh, the you know the time series, you find that there is quite quite a consistent level of support for democracy, and then periods where it increases, and then a consistent, and then periods where it increases and consistent. Um, and some people have thought, so I think here, some of the work by actually Josh Tucker and Grigal Popelikish that looked at support for democracy in post-communist states, they were looking at generational or cohort effects in relation to this. Is it past experience, pre-communist, uh, pre-transition to democracy, uh, communist era experiences that drive these differences? Um, so I think there's interesting stuff there, uh, but I see no evidence that, uh, and it wasn't after the Orange Revolution, it was very much after Yushchenko's presidency that some people suggested there was an increase in the dissatisfaction with government and, uh, and a general, I think, stepping away from politics amongst many voters. There's data to suggest that, but there's not data to suggest that there was a massive drop in support for democracy or democratic values. Uh, I do not know of any such data, so perhaps someone else does, and I'd be happy to take a look at it. Um, and that wasn't in the immediate period after the Orange Revolution. That, as I say, that was in that, pres that, that throughout that whole presidency, and specifically because of some of the very intense uh, battles that were happening between the prime ministers and the president throughout that period, and the constitutional changes, and how that affected it, and the general. I mean, there's some some work on this specifically the the kind of uh, the, the stagnant nature of policy development in the latter period of uh, Yushchenko's pre presidency, perhaps not because of Yushchenko himself, but because of the kind of political context and the very tense um, battles between parliament and president that were ensuing at different points in time. And that was mapped on to support for, I mean, dissatisfaction rising, uh, I believe trust uh, also declined uh, and a few other indicators I'm sure were also, but I don't believe that support for democracy declined in those. And when it comes to Mark's paper, which I obviously love as well, <laughs> a very famous paper on Ukraine and protest, um, there's actually something that we've been working on with Henry as well, a paper that has been now rejected a few times, so maybe we're wrong, but um, we precisely try to slice up a little bit more concretely the distinction between a positive and a negative protest frame, right? Uh, that, and I think, whereas the Orange Revolution, it wasn't, it was, you know, one could argue that that was there as well, but really uh, that's not quite clear. In the Yevro Maidan, you definitely have a frame that is against something, against Yanukovych, against uh, Yanukovych's regime and repression, and for something, for Euro integration. And we actually try to look at how that connects to different things like support for democracy. Um, and we find that there's similar, uh, when it comes to um, believing one is a winner of transition, 
uh, support for democracy and electoral engagement, those things all positively correlate with supporting either of the two uh, protest frames, protest narratives. Um, so both negative and positive in nature. And again, we don't see a decline in support for democracy after Yevr Maidan. And we don't see a decline in support for democracy after the commencement of war, which I think many scholars expected to happen in Ukraine. Um, so I don't, I'm not trying to paint the rosiest of rosy pictures in Ukraine, but I think there's something more interesting happening there in the eight years that perhaps we haven't been paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you made that case very well. We take another couple of questions and Harold is asking if you could say a little bit more about the category of those who do not support democracy. Um, are those anti-democrats? Are they people who don't believe in the existing democratic institutions? So this also revolves around what it means or what people connect with the term democracy. Is it about democratic institutions, civic activism, something else? I'm sure you're going to say, I wish we had more questions, but uh, <laughs> I leave the answer to you. So um, let's just be clear what that survey item includes. It's a very famous survey item. It is the most used survey item for asking people um, their preferences on uh, different political systems. Um, and also it's a survey item that has counterparts of other survey items that are very similar to it. So many people have asked this sort of question in slightly different ways, but nonetheless, um, with its all of its imperfections, it is a, uh, it is a two part um, or three part survey item almost everywhere. And it starts off with uh, there's usually a preamble, and then the respondent is asked, uh, with which of the following statements do you agree most? Or um, on a scale of one to whatever, which of the following statement, you know, do, do you agree uh, with the following statement? So the first statement is democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. And that is internationally, whether it's in World Values Survey, I believe, or other, this is more or less the, the, the way that it's asked. And the question is very much on uh, um, a democratic system for government for one's country. Then in a separate statement, individuals are asked again with they agree or disagree with uh, the statement or on a scale. Under some circumstances, an authoritarian government can be preferable to a democratic one. Uh, another um, version of this question is about strong uh, man in the past, now strong leadership uh, in today's context. Uh, and the third um, statement of this three-part survey item is for people like me, it doesn't matter whether we have a democratic or non-democratic regime. So in our survey, we ask people to tell them, to tell us which do they agree with more, most. Democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Uh, under some circumstances, an authoritarian government can be preferable to a democratic one. Or people like me, for people like me, it doesn't matter whether we have a democracy or non-democracy. So those who are non-democrats, uh, Fabian, that 40% is a combination, in fact, of under some circumstances, and for people like me, it doesn't matter. Uh, but let me show you exactly right now, because it was in the slide. I said so much so quickly. Um, so the black dotted line, uh, the, the the second to the bottom line here. We can't going see from your 16. screen yet. Oh, you can't see my screen? No. That's twice that that happened. And now you can. Yes, yes. now we can. Uh, so here, the black dotted line, uh, second to the bottom here, that goes from 16% uh, to 12% in the period between 2019 and 2022. Those are the people who believe that an authoritarian system of government is preferable to a democratic one, right? So if you really want to be, uh, I think, quite unfair to these individuals, to be perfectly honest, you might call them authoritarians. And some people have in their scholarly work. Then the gray dashed line right here are the people that say, for people like me, it doesn't matter whether I live in a democratic or non-democratic system or regime. So if you can see over the time period, and then finally, sorry, that gray dotted line, that is the very bottom line here that goes from 19% in 2019 
to, 20, uh, to 7% in 2022, those are the people who either selected hard to say or they refuse to answer this question point blank. So what we really see is that there are two groups from which Democrats are found or from two positions from to which people move to support democracy in Ukraine over this period. The two positions are those who told us that they are more, uh, uh, that they see authoritarian systems as potentially more appropriate under some circumstances, and those who found it hard to say or refuse to answer. Those two positions decline over the, th over the three years, but the position that does not decline and stays pretty much even, uh, statistically speaking, is that for people like me, it doesn't matter um, which uh, system uh, we, are, uh, we have in our country. So that's who the non-Democrats are. Of course, you can do this analysis exactly for this. You can look at those quote unquote authoritarians over time and see how they change and why they change over time. And if there are any people who become more uh, move to authoritarianism, that is also possible. It's not something that I haven't checked in our data extensively yet. Um, but yes, that's that's the, the breakdown. And the dependent variable, um, which I think is the clearest when it comes to these sort of uh, statistical analyses is, is a binary dummy, whereby the one is denoted by all those who declare a pro-democratic position, and the zero is all others, um, rather than deciding that those who answered hard to say are, you know, should be discounted from the analysis. I think they shouldn't precisely because we see that is where the movement is happening from over this period. Okay, thank you. The last um, is really a comment or a question. Um, you can decide if you want to still say a sentence on that, but I think it's a part of a bigger talk. Um, Fabian is saying that he finds it interesting uh, or reminds us again of what you showed that um, support for democracy is up, sense of civic duty, but nevertheless 40% want to leave. Um, and then it ends with, I'm very interested in the next survey results or the next analysis. Um, uh, I think that would be too much for you to explain all of that. I don't know if you want um, a, a minute to kind of, I think it goes to the heart also of the mobilized project of um, who, who wants to leave and who wants to say something in a, in a country in a particular context. So I think we just leave it as a as a final final comment that there's more more to analyze or you're opening your mouth. Maybe you want to say something on it. <laughs> well, it depends if you want us to preview what is coming in the findings yeah. of the mobilizer. Why not? I think, so two things, Fabian, I think you, you pointed out something that's very important. Wanting to leave on February 16th may or may not be the same as leaving now. So we cannot compare these two things side by side. But you are right that a lot of people wanted to leave. In fact, almost 40% of the population. Not The question, to be clear, is not wanting to leave. But if I had the opportunity, I would, right? So that's a little bit different from a direct, I want to leave uh, today or tomorrow or the next week. But I hate to break it to everyone. Uh, at least until this uh, all-out uh, invasion and extension of Russian uh, uh, war in Ukraine occurred on February 24th. Political drivers were more correlated, and I checked the data, Gwen, it doesn't change. So I think we see more people willing to protest because we also see more Democrats. If you recall, those who intend to, or are ready to protest were also more likely to be Democrats. So we're going to see some endogeneity happening in our research, but we don't see more uh, people who actually believe, and this is the real cool thing in our data and really weird, we don't see people who believe that the economic situation is worse. We actually see more people telling us that their economic situation is better over the period of the last two years, which we have to take, we have to ask these Ukrainians if you are, you're taking this don't think meagerly thing to extremes because people are evaluating their personal financial situations and the economic circumstances of the country better over time. So with that, <laughs> with that opening a new can of worms, I will end there. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Ola. Um, thank you for a fantastic talk and, and for um, answering so many and very wide ranging um, questions on that. So we'll, of course, have you back um, and back at SOIS and hopefully also in person before, before long. But thank you so much to, um, that you participated in this um, among all the other one million things you're currently doing in various locations. So thank you very much. And I'd just like to also uh, refer you um, to the fact that, of course, the series continues. And next Thursday at the same time, 5.30 Central European time, we have John O'Loughlin from the University of Colorado and Gerard Toll from Virginia Tech talk about um, the perils and benefits of surveying in a conflict zone, or maybe we should say a war zone, cautionary tales and results from Donbass 2020 to 2022. So I hope to also um, see some of you um, uh, listening in today, commenting, asking questions again then. There are many thank yous to you, Ola. I hope you've seen that um, in the chat. That's been actually lovely about the series so far. I, I, I think it's the first one that I intend or I'm part, attend or I'm part of where so many people um, are very also nice in, in thanking the speakers in the, in the chat. So um, with, without further ado then, let's close the session here for today. Thank you so much again and see you hopefully again at the next sessions. Bye-bye. Thank you for having me.